We are at the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. Sitting in the middle of a 13,000 square mile radio quiet zone is a 100 meter diameter telescope. This telescope collects radio waves from across the cosmos, allowing astronomers to study galaxies, black holes, and star formation. In order for this telescope to make these amazing observations, it takes a lot of different people and a wide variety of jobs. We've got an all access pass to take you with us up there to learn about the telescope and the careers involved with it. This, this is STEM in 30. 30. Hi, I'm Beth. And I'm Marty. What comes to mind when you think of observatory? Do you think of a domed building with a really big telescope and an astronomer looking through an eyepiece? Well, we are about to blow your mind. We are at the Green Bank Observatory, a place so big a domed building cannot contain it. And the way that it observes is very different than this. It takes many different people and jobs to make observations using this telescope. Today we're going to introduce you to a lot of them. Each of them is important and connected. Before we get into that, let's learn more about this amazing observatory. Located in Green Bank, West Virginia, the Green Bank Observatory is home to the Robert C. Byrd Green Bank Telescope, the world's largest fully steerable radio telescope. 16 wheels carry 17 million pounds of equipment on a steel track. This rotation allows the telescope to pinpoint planets, stars, asteroids, and other astronomical phenomena across the universe. Because the telescope listens for interstellar radio waves, it is important that it be located within the National Radio Quiet Zone, which allows for the detection of faint radio frequency signals, which man-made signals might otherwise mask. This remote location has been the site of important radio astronomy telescopes since 1957. Aside from the Robert C. Byrd Green Bank Telescope, Green Bank is home to seven other telescopes, and radio astronomers are using them to listen to the remote whispers of the universe to discover the answers to our most astounding astronomical questions. If you're inspired by astronomy, we welcome you to visit our Science Center, featuring our indoor star lab. If you want to get up close and personal with the telescopes, there are tours which offer a peek into the world of radio astronomy through hands-on science demonstrations, followed by a bus tour into the restricted zones surrounding the telescopes. There are also walking, hiking, and biking trails that take you through the beautiful scenery around the telescope. Behind us is the Green Bank Telescope, and it is huge. Let's give this telescope a little perspective. The main dish has a diameter of 100 meters. That's longer than a football field. It weighs 17 million pounds, or 8,500 tons. That's more than 1,400 school buses. And it's tall. It is 485 feet, which puts it taller than the Statue of Liberty in New York and the Elizabeth Tower, which you might know as Big Ben in London. It's also taller than the Saturn V rocket that took humans to the moon and the new SLS rocket that will take us back. Let's move a little closer to talk to someone who works on this massive telescope. And because we're moving closer, we're gonna need these. This is Anthony, he does maintenance on the telescope. Anthony, tell us about your job here. Well, I'm considered the uh, technical manager for telescope operations, so Basically my job is if it moves, then I am responsible for it. So it has to do with motors, the track work, there's actuators, the whole dish itself, everything. So anything that moves, we take care of. How did you get interested in this? Well, I grew up uh, here in West Virginia, joined the Navy, got out of the Navy and became an electrician. This is relatively local to me, so I've always had a fascination about the telescopes. So job came open and I showed up here. And can you tell us about the team of people that work on the telescope? Yeah, there's a pretty diverse group of uh, people working on it, everything from engineers to mechanics. The mechanic crew, which is who I'm working with most time, we're taking care of anything that's 
greasing wise, uh, the, the wheels themselves, any of the actuators, and then the uh, electricians and uh, engineers will come in and working with any of the um, steady state type operations. So. I was pointing out your grease boots. So do you want to tell us what's going on with all of this yes. today? <laughs> so uh, this week is uh, affectionately known as track work week. So the uh, track, there's 48 plates uh, that the wheels run across. And every year, once a year, we pull them up and we do any kind of maintenance we need to to the, the, ba the plates underneath. It's a greasy job and nobody likes to do it, but it has to be done. So. How important is the maintenance that's going on here? So the telescope is very, very precise instrument. So any, the track has to be precise, I guess you'd say. So as it's moving, we can, they can feel the movement and they can tell a difference in the sound and it creates distortion. So if we keep up with this, it uh, makes observing easier for the data analysis. Tell us about the wheels that are behind us. The wheels are, uh, you can see they're a very big structure. There's a uh, 16 across the telescope and so they say there's 1.1 million pounds resting on each wheel. They're only 11 inches wide so you know this whole all the way to the entire structure is running on that little track and those wheels. What's your favorite part of your job? Uh, mine, my favorite thing is dealing with the motors and uh, like so each year our part of our job too is we take apart the motors, we polish the commutators, we redo, just redo the entire thing so and I take pride in it because if the motors don't work then no one's going to get to do their job. So it's an important job and I like it. So you really like getting your hands dirty and getting in there and seeing what, what's going on inside the motor? I do. I always thought electrical engineering would be more about um, math and design, but it's not. I can get in there, I get my hands dirty every day, and I like to solve problems and just fix things, take them apart and rebuild them. So it's a pretty rewarding job. So you've got to go up there and work. Does the height bother you? No, the height, uh, I kind of embrace the heights. I, I like being up there, um, it's a little adrenaline rush and uh, plus the view is just perfect up there. So, you know, you guys ought to, got to get up there and take a look at it. <laughs> Today, we're going to go up and introduce you to some of the careers here at the Green Bank Observatory. Great. Great, that's something Marty really doesn't like. In fact, when they're in the sidewalk, he walks around them. To be honest, Beth and I are both really pretty nervous about going up there. It is outside our comfort zone. Things that make me uncomfortable are when I have to wear hard hats, fire retardant suits, any sort of life vest, and frankly, any sort of adventure my producer thinks would be cool. Sometimes it's good to get out of your comfort zone, even if it scares you, assuming that you can do it safely it'll expose you to new opportunities. Well, I guess it's time for us to head up there. What are we <laughs> doing? I, th this was our producer's idea, not mine. Just Here we go. <laughs> Going up there. We just heard about how much fun Anthony has taking things apart. If this sounds interesting, here's something you can try. Hi, I'm Raji Ganguly at Sterling Middle School. Have you guys ever wondered what's inside a hairdryer or a mixer? All of these objects were invented to fulfill a need. Someone had to conceptualize, design, and create these. Sometimes these were improvements on previous objects other times, they were entirely new. Today, you're going to be taking apart these devices to see how the parts inside function together to make the device. Are you guys ready to take apart these appliances? Yes! Go ahead and put your goggles on and get started. As you take apart your appliances, keep track of the parts you remove. Lay them out on the poster board in a way that helps show how the parts interact. 
you can almost see this poster board as a work of art. You don't have to understand how each part works, but look for how the different parts interact with each other. Be sure you're careful with the tools and ask an adult for help if something won't come apart. You guys did an awesome job. So, what did you discover today? Um, I discovered that a little thing has so many different parts in it that it's kind of overwhelming. I realized that there's lots of different moving parts in a mixer and there's like different small fans in it to move all the pieces at the same time. Was there anything that surprised you? Um, it surprised me that there was a rope in the cords, um, like keep them from touching each other. I was surprised there was a computer chip and a hairdryer. I think it like powered everything to turn on. What do you wonder now? I wonder how important is every part in a like maybe like hair dryer because like one part could be like really important but it's like really small or one part could be really big but it's not that important. Now that we've taken apart a small hair dryer, I wonder what's really in a huge hair dryer. I also wonder how it compares to a leaf blower. And finally, what was the most interesting part you found? Uh, the most interesting part was this part of the motor. I thought it was really interesting because for this, for this blender or mixer, they use such a big thing for such a little thing like that. Um, the most interesting part, I think, was this. We found this part in our like machine, and they had the same part, but with a different machine. One part can be used by many things. Esta cosa fue más difícil porque porque esto fue muy difícil de quitar de esto. You guys did an awesome job. Now, put them back together. One of the things that makes this telescope so valuable is that it can move. In order to listen to the whispering universe or those far away radio waves, this telescope has to turn its giant ear toward them. Have you ever seen a dog or cat move its ears and then turn its head toward the noise? This telescope can do the same thing in order to get a better listen. Of course, it's not as easy as just turning your head. It takes a specially trained person to move this 17 million pound telescope. Do you think you know what it takes to turn a telescope? My job is a telescope operation specialist. I am the jack of all trades, master of none. I am responsible for uh, monitoring software and hardware systems during observations. I'm pretty much making sure the telescope is behaving and taking data. We move the telescope using something called an OCU, which stands for an Operator Control Unit. It's at the base of the telescope, and it has a series of knobs and dials that we can use to control its azimuth, which is how around it goes, and then its elevation, which is how far up and down it goes. And then that is connected to a digitized version of our software over here. So to move the telescope, it's just as simple as clicking a couple of buttons. But once the telescope collects all of these radio waves, what do you do with them? Someone has to analyze that data. And data analyst isn't a job just limited to working at radio telescopes. We've worked with data analysts from NASA to NOAA. But what does a data analyst do? So a data analyst uh, means something slightly different here at Green Bank Observatory. So we have scientists around the world who come and use the telescope and I help them prepare for their projects. So that's the main part of my job is I help them set up from, hey, I have this really amazing idea. I got accepted. My proposal is accepted. How do I observe with the Green Bank Telescope? So I will help train them in the beginning. I will help them write their scripts if they need help, uh, which is how we control the telescope. I'll help them with their data reduction. And I also do many different projects across the observatory. Green Bank Observatory, to use the telescope, you need to write a Python script, which is how our system interacts with the telescope. So our software division set up this whole uh, control system, and you write in just a standard Python script in order to tell the telescope how to configure, how to slew and move to the telescope, and then also how to actually take the data. So when the data comes in, we have some pre-processing so that what you see is a spectral line if you're observing that. Um, so it sort of looks 
like a bunch of wiggles and then a spike. Uh, so it's, it's kind of non-intuitive. It's not like an optical telescope where you can see an image. We have to actually create those images afterwards. Uh, for a pulsar, it's the same thing, but you'll see a pulsing signal that will be very periodic and that we can actually track very precisely. A pulsar is a rapidly rotating neutron star that emits a radiation at its poles. It's magnetized, and so what we see is if it's in the correct line of sight, we see these pulses coming to us on Earth. So it's very much like a lighthouse. The skills you need to be a data analyst, uh, coding is very helpful. We do a lot of coding, both in Python and something called GBT-IDL, which is our version of IDL, and various other languages that you sort of pick up along the way. Um, other skills you need are sort of basic astronomy skills, um, understanding the world around you, but mostly being curious and being willing to learn, I think, is the biggest skill that you need to have. I was not in radio astronomy when I started my career and had to learn radio astronomy sort of from the ground up when I joined and just knowing that I'm helping and sitting in the same place that so many amazing scientists have been at has been truly mind blowing. As you can imagine, collecting radio waves from across the cosmos requires some pretty complex computing. Another very important job here at the Green Bank Observatory is that of being a software engineer. Um, so I'm a software engineer at Green Bank. Um, we basically make sure that all the software is running and updated on the telescope. There's a lot of code that goes into making sure that all of the processes on the telescope connect to each other. So when you run a scan, you want to make sure that what you think you are doing is actually what's happening. Um, so that can be moving the uh, receiver into the correct position so that you're using the right receiver to get your data. Um, that also can mean that you're reducing your data um, and making that data look the way that you want it to look in a usable form. There's a lot of different ways that data can be reduced. It depends what you want the data for. Basically, it means taking raw data from the telescope. So uh, data is read from the sky through the receiver into some storage file in one of our machines. And then you want to make that data usable to different scientists or different people who are interested. And you can reduce that data to uh, have that um, just be a usable form and something that you're interested in uh, for whatever data you are trying to explain. We chose a specific location for the observatory to be in because it is in a valley in a very tall mountain in West Virginia. Um, so that valley blocks out a lot of the RFI from um, cell towers around the area and those cell towers will emit radio frequencies that will impact a lot of our data. Um, so in sitting inside of this valley and having a lot of the RFI um, mitigation tactics that we have, it helps us out a lot to keep RFI out of the GBT and keep RFI out of the data. The biggest way that we can actually publish software here at Green Bank is by releasing it into production. Um, so we do a lot of development, we do a lot of coding and creating of, of our projects. Um, and then when we have tested that, we've sponsor tested it, we got that okayed by everyone, we're actually able to release it onto the telescope and into the main kind of function of the code. Um, we do publish on certain websites like um, GitHub, and that's basically just to log the changes that we've made, not exactly to kind of spread that software. In terms of scientists, they do um, do a lot of publishing of their papers and publishing their works to kind of spread that message. A lot of the software we use gets used on the telescope, so it just kind of stays internal. At this point in my career, I do, I have released some code onto the telescope and thankfully it's still working and the telescope still has not fallen down. So that's always a plus. Uh, there are some things that you can put into that production um, if you need to. There are a lot of comments that you can put in the code that actually won't change how the code runs. Um, but if you wanna put um, certain things, letting people know that you've worked on the code, there are absolutely ways to do that. Um, I know a lot of times there are certain images added to the code um, of people's pets and, and things like that if you've created your project. So there are definitely signatures that people have on that telescope. If working with software sounds fun to you, you should look into coding. And a really neat way to see coding in action is with drones. Our friends at Stonehill Middle School coded their very own drone air show. Coding drones is a great way to explore computer programming in a really fun way. The students at Stonehill Middle School were challenged to program drones to fly in formation, like an air show. Their task was to program drones to fly a series of aerial maneuvers, but they didn't stop there. Students also had to sync their drone's movement to their own musical compositions that they also created. With code, their drones had to do flips, spins, 
and fly in formations of up to four drones at a time. Each drone was programmed to follow a unique set of instructions using the student's code. Just like engineers, the students had to test their programs, fail, and learn from those failures, reflect on their work, and then regroup to fix mistakes and start that process all over again until their drones were ready to do what they wanted them to do. The final air shows were really impressive. The skills the students showed by coding these drones to do specific tasks directly relates to the work done at Green Bank Observatory. Code, test, fail, learn, and fix before implementing the final code. Who knows, in a few years, maybe some of these students will be working at Green Bank Observatory helping discover new things about our universe. Right now we're on the reflector level, but there is a higher level. That's where the instruments are that collect all of those radio waves. Let's head up. That's the elevator shaking, not my legs, right? Yeah. Or is it both? I think it's both. Okay. We are at the top, the very top of the telescope, higher than the Statue of Liberty, taller than the Pyramids of Giza, the very top. <laughs> and behind us are the receivers. This is where the radio waves go, get processed for the scientists to use. Scientists that use this telescope don't have to come up here. As a matter of fact, some of them never even come to West Virginia. So if climbing up to the top of this telescope isn't your thing, we get it. Let's meet one of those scientists. I'm a staff scientist here at Green Bank, so that means that I get to do a whole bunch of different things. I get to work with the observers that come to use the telescope, and so I get to help them try to get their science off the telescope and go from, you know, things up in the sky to data on a paper that they get to share with other people. The type of research I do is I look at what we call a low surface brightness galaxies. These are um, other galaxies out there in the universe that are very, very diffuse. For whatever reason, their stars and their gas are just spread out much more so than many other galaxies. And what's curious about these objects is the fact that they have lots of gas. So why does that matter? Well, gas is the stuff that turns into stars. So I study a type of galaxy um, because of this very unusual property of it. And then I try to use those to understand things like the Milky Way itself and the star formation in our own galaxy. As an astronomer, I would like to go out, I like to do science, I like to learn about science, it's a ton of fun. But honestly, if I'm not also able to share that science with other people, then I'm really just kind of doing it for myself. We think what we do is pretty cool, so we want the general public to think that too. And we absolutely love working with kids as well and having them come through here, because then we get to hope that maybe someday one of these kids will go, gosh, maybe I'll be an astronomer, or maybe I'll grow up and become an engineer and help us out and help us do the next big discovery. Anybody in the world can apply to use the, the telescope here, and the way we work is through what we call peer-reviewed proposals. It doesn't matter who you are, if you've got a really cool science idea that you can tell other scientists and convince them that it's really cool, you're going to get time on our telescope. So I, I have the, the privilege of being in the group of uh, staff scientists who go through all of the proposals that we see. There's always a couple proposals every semester, every six months when we review these, where we look at that and we all just go, well, now that's a neat proposal and we get really excited about it. So we get all sorts of different kinds of proposals covering just huge types of science areas. That's part of why it's so fun to work here. Uh, we get science doing things like looking at black holes, um, where we're actually using not just the GBT, but a bunch of telescopes around the world to try to peer into the edges of black holes and try to study them. Uh, we get really neat proposals to look at uh, chemistry in the universe. And so the GBT gets used to go and look for re really complex molecules, the stuff you need to create life. And the GBT happens to be the best telescope in the world to go look for these things. So math is kind of the, under, the underpinning, you can think of it, for all of the science that we do. It's cool to get data from the telescope, but the really cool part is to try to say, what does this data mean? And the only way to understand that is to really look at the physics or the chemistry behind what you saw. And to understand the physics and chemistry, you really have to understand the math that sits behind it. 
I love working at a telescope. Um, it's just, it's fun to be part of the discoveries. It's fun to get to see what's going on and hear what's going on from the different scientists. It's fun to have the scientists here because you get to hear their excitement about what they're doing. And it's just an incredible amount of fun to just see the really good science coming out of the telescope here. And also getting to know you helped out with it. And that's a nice, nice feeling. It is time for us to get back in that elevator and head down to the bottom. Not soon enough for me. We're going to meet up with one of the STEM educators here at the Green Bank Observatory. I'm Sophie St. George. I work here at the Green Bank Observatory as a education specialist. And part of my job is working with student groups during our summer camps, as well as statewide outreach. I'm gonna demonstrate the importance of radio frequency interference and protecting our telescopes from that interference that we cause every day in our own lives with cell phones and key fobs. The first of which includes this Faraday cage, which is a pretty rudimentary version of a Faraday cage. And its purpose is to protect the antenna that's inside. So how a Faraday cage works is this copper mesh is reflective to radio waves and their waves cannot get through this mesh so they bounce off and are reflected. And right now we can see with the door ajar already showing in our spectrum analyzer kind of low down here. As we open the door you'll see that signal getting brighter. This antenna is uh, able to pick up radio waves and so it's able to see parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we cannot. With that door shut, we see the signal it may still be a little bit of a bump, but ultimately it goes away. We use this kind of technology, Faraday cages on site, to protect our, our radio telescopes from radio frequency interference. We used to sell these fans in the gift shop, but we don't anymore. Um, so lots of different point sources or interferences at specific frequencies. We can see these as sharp lines raising up from that baseline. As we move the fan outside the box further away from the antenna and also protected by this copper mesh, um, we see those peaks still, but they're significantly reduced. Another thing that we have to manage at the observatory are our receivers. They are electronic devices, which we've just seen produce radio frequency interference. And so we have to cool these down cryogenically and we use compressed helium to do so. And I'm gonna demonstrate a little bit of how that works to make a less noisy system. I don't have compressed helium with me, um, but I do have liquid nitrogen, which is very cold at negative 321 degrees Fahrenheit. We're gonna start here by taking a very energetic system like this balloon that I've blown up. I've put molecules in there and they're in their gas state. So they're bouncing off the walls. They're making this balloon look expanded, look blown up. And we're gonna see what happens when we cool those molecules down. So you can see that liquid nitrogen pouring out. And when we take, again, this energetic system in the balloon and pop it in there, think about what you might see happening. And just looking in, we see this latex becoming more plastic in appearance. We hear it crinkling. And we also see our balloon constricting. And when we pull it out, we'll see just exactly what's happened. Those molecules that were gas are now liquid. You can see that sort of cloudy white. We'll just let that sort of expand again. It's not reinflating, but those molecules that went from very energetic, very noisy in that gas phase, which they're returning to, were much more quiet, less energetic, and so we use this concept to cool these receivers down that have electronic components and create less noisy systems so that we don't see a whole lot of fuzzy interference from our own technology and we can really capture the signal that's coming from space. Pretty cool. We are out of time here at the Green Bank Observatory. We'd like to thank everybody who shared their jobs with us. And we want to remind everyone that the jobs you saw today are not the only professions here at the Green Bank Observatory. You also have bus drivers, cooks, grounds crew, machinists, and many others. Each of them plays an important role. We hope to inspire you to learn even more. 
We want you to continue to push yourselves safely outside your comfort zone. Who knows, you might discover a future career. And if you like this episode, be sure to follow STEM in 30 on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. I still can't believe we were on the top of there. Why not? Because it was scary. Sc literally, scariest thing I've ever done. We are at the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. That's the whole thing. Thanks for coming. Hi, I'm Beth. I wasn't ready. Okay. Are you ready now? I'm, I'm ready now. Mike's going to put a <laughs> over that. Hi. I wasn't ready again. I was Please, looking you down! Say okay, and I think you're ready to go. <laughs> I can actually see Mike through it. Look at the trees swing. I don't, so, I don't want a, to look at the trees. Hey, Marty, look how small the truck is from up here. Marty, I'm not kidding when I say this. Don't look straight down. Just don't do it.